Baruch Atah Adinoy Eleinim and Achelam, Shehakol Nebit Borei. L'chaim, everybody, L'chaim. So life is full of surprises. Life is full of awareness. And that awareness, that knowledge, comes in two different ways. One is informational. Either whether you read from a book, you listen to a podcast, you come to a class, you gain information, right? But then there is the awareness that we have, the knowledge that we gain from life itself, the circumstances of life, things that happen. And it becomes the learning ground. As the sages say, there's no wisdom like the experience of life and the um, challenges of life. And of course, something like marriage, you can read all the books you want, but until you get into the circle, <laughs> the ring, <laughs> um, you'll never really know. Parenting, likewise. But it could be something simple as learning to ride a bike. You read all the books about it. And maybe as a six-year-old, you you know, you're an avid reader. I watch all of the um, YouTube videos about riding a bike. But of course, getting on that bike, having the experience, having the the, the falls, the scrapes of the knee, and the entanglement of your clothes or your tzitzis, you know, it can get entangled in the... <laughs> teaches you things that no podcast, no book, no teacher could teach you. And of course, we need both things in our lives. So with that in mind, Allah We know that Moshe spent 40 days and nights on Sinai. As a matter of fact, today's Yontif, a good Yontif to everybody. It's the 13th day of Tammuz. It's the day that the previous Rebbe was actually released from prison. He was told about his release on the 12th. And in fact, left imprisonment on the 13th. So it's a big young tip. While he was in prison, in solitary confinement, he didn't know the difference between day and night. Except, you know, when the guards would say, make a statement of sorts, you know, get up, you know, here's some water, uh, you know, whatever the command of the uh, of the time was. But he likened it to Moses being on Mount Sinai, where there was no, no day or night. He didn't eat or drink. And he learned. He learned from God Almighty, direct. And of course, everything that he learned, he shared. He shared with us in the five books of Moses, as we know. And actually, that's what is written. But he shared much more. He shared the oral tradition together with the written word. But there are, however, several laws and Moshe didn't teach us up front. They were only taught to us when the need arose. And we have one example of that in this week's Torah portion. The reins of leadership are being passed on in this parsha. From Moshe to Yoshua to Joshua. And part of that passing over the reins is the count of the Jewish people. 
and is also about the inheritance that the Jewish people will have in the land of Israel. And the way it is, is that whoever um, has sons, they will get a certain portion amongst their tribe to inherit in the land. But there arose a problem. And that was with Tzlovchad, who, a father, blessed with children, but no sons. He had five daughters. Hey, I also have five daughters. But then again, I have five sons too. <laughs> so he has only, um, only. It's a beautiful thing to only have five daughters. But the problem is the laws of inheritance did not say anything about what happens when a father doesn't have any sons that will inherit the land that is his due. There were no provisions made for a female inheritor. And this is where the story begins for us in the Parsha. Let us... Okay. I'll share the screen here. As the old saying goes, sharing is caring. That's what we call it. Share the screen. As sharing is caring. One second. No, it's not going to help. Alrighty. Can you read it? You see it on the screen? Text 1a from the Parsha. The daughters of Tzlovchad of the Menashe family, son of Achefer, son of Gilad, son of Machir, son of Menashe, son of Yosef, came forward. The names of the daughters were, were uh, Machla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. They stood before Meshe Allah, the priest, the chieftains, and the whole assembly at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they said, Our father died in the wilderness. He did not belong to the Kerov's faction, which banded together against God. Rather, he died of his own sin, and he has left no sons. Let our father's name, let our father's name, uh, let not our sorry, our father's name be lost to his clan just because he has no son. Give us a holding among our father's kinsmen. Moshe brought the case before God, and God did not disappoint. As the next verse goes, and Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Slavchad's daughters speak justly, certainly give them a portion of inheritance along with their father's brothers, and transfer their father's inheritance to them. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, a man dies and, and has no son, transfers his inheritance to his daughter. Beautiful. So for all intents and purposes, you know, the story concludes with Tzlovchad's daughters who will inherit that which is rightfully theirs, right? They're entitled when they will arrive to the land of Israel. But this is not the only time that Moshe had to bring a case before God Almighty. There are actually several of them, but let's take one other example. And that was in Parshas Baal Oishcha, a few weeks ago. There we had the story of the second Passover. You learned about it, I'm sure you recall. There were men who were ritually impure because of the contact with a dead person and therefore could not offer the Passover sacrifice on that day. They approached Moshe and Aaron on that day. Those men said to him, we are ritually unclean because of contact with, dead, with a dead person. Why should we be excluded so as not to bring the offering of the Lord in its appointed time with all the children of Israel? Moshe said to them, wait, and I will hear what God will instruct you to do. God spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying any person who becomes unclean, contact with the dead, 
or is this uh, on a distant journey, whether among you or in the future generations, should offer the Passover sacrifice to God. They should offer it in the second month on the 14th day, is the month of year, uh, a month later after Passover. In the afternoon, they should eat it with matzahs and bitter herbs. So this is another event when Moshe had to bring a question before God. Now, in both cases, the people brought their case, not just before Moshe, but others as well. The daughters of Tzlovchad, they spoke to Moshe and Elazar and the leaders of the tribes. When the men wanted to bring a offering for for Pesach, which they couldn't in the first month, they wanted to bring in the, in the second month, it was Moshe and his brother Ari. How do we understand that? Why is it being brought before several people in our Parsha and in the story of the, in Parsha's Baleischa, the second Passover is brought before Moshe and Ari? Who is the teacher? Who's the one that learned from God? Who's the one who's going to get the answers from God? Is of course, is Moshe, right? So shouldn't the question only be brought to him? Furthermore, you know, if you're going to bring the question to, um, if you're going to bring the question to Moshe, right? And he doesn't know, then obviously no one else is going to know. And if you're there together with uh, Moshe and Aaron, or with the others, the lead, other leaders, and you're going, why would you ask them instead of asking Moshe? So Rashi offers us an answer. And Rashi says, what does it mean before Moshe and Aaron? They asked both, as both were seated in the study hall. One cannot suggest that they asked Aaron after Moshe because if Moshe didn't know, how would Aaron know? So similarly, in our episode of uh, the Daughters of Tzolofchad, the Torah uses a comparable language and Rashi gives us a parallel message. We see in text 2C, before Moshe and then before Elazar, if Moshe didn't know, how would Elazar know? Abba Hanan said in the name of Rabbi Elazar, they were all seated in the study hall and the daughters stood to speak before them all at once. Okay, so we see a common thing. They were in the study hall, right? In the base midrash, as it's called in Hebrew. Chaim. Or the yeshiva, if you will, right? So what do we have over here? In both instances, Moshe did not know the answer because it was not given to him earlier, right? Which for that, we need to understand why. Why wasn't it given earlier? In both times, a new law is generated as a result of this experience. Why is it... Because of this, this new law has to now be generated. Why isn't it something that was foretold earlier by God Almighty? I mean, obviously, there's going to be some father that's not going to have any sons. He's only going to have daughters. And, um, and it can be also maybe pretty obvious that some people are going to be impure and can't bring the Paschal Lamb offering. So we need to understand that. Furthermore, we need to understand, like, they came to ask the question, and Punks, where was Moshe Rabbein? Where was he put exactly? In both instances, in the base of Midrash, in the study hall, in the yeshiva, right, where there's mutual kind of study going on. Right? Now, we need to understand that exactly. We know that when Moshe taught, like his day, if you will, was separated between the times that he taught the people, which was a large gathering of people in front of the Mishkan of the tent of meeting that the people came. And he would convey God's message to the people. He would see, teach them. 
Then, of course, there's times that he was studying privately. And then there were the times that he was in the study hall. So this one time he was with Arain, another time he was uh, in our Parsha, he was with the Lazar, with the elders, and so on. So according to Rashi's explanation, the two times that we have in our, in, in our instance of our Parsha, and the Parsha is Baloischa, with the story of Pesach Sheni, both times he happens to be in the house of study. Why? Why there? Is it just happenstance? Or is this a detail that's integral to the storyline? Of course, everything in Torah is very exacting. So you might just say, well, it just happens where I met the person, and that's where I asked the question. Well, nothing is by happenstance, especially when it comes to the righteous. It is all uh, with profound meaning. Because a righteous person doesn't just find themselves in a place. We could find ourselves in a place, you know, <laughs> in a place where either we shouldn't be or we are, and, you know, we don't know what we're doing there. But a righteous person is exactly where they need to be at the time they need to be there in every aspect. Especially when we speak about a Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, the Moses of the generation is exactly such an individual. We also need to understand like these different kind of places of, uh, of, uh, of study or of engagement with Torah privately, study hall, and then the public thoroughfare where you are teaching everyone. Okay, so let's unpack these two events to get a little clarity on them, on what they're about, then we'll get some understanding to our questions. We'll start off with the one that's not in our Parsha, the previous Parsha in Baal Oishcha, or a few weeks ago, Pesach Sheni, the second Passover, right? Now, of course, what is Pesach Sheni is the idea that person was an impure, or distant, not able to bring a Paschal lamb offering the first time around, which is on the eve of Passover, is the offering is uh, slaughtered, it, the, the, the sheep, the Paschal lamb, and it is eaten on the night of Passover, right? Um, what is the concept of it? The simple concept is in the Shtokan for Fallon, there's never a lost hope if a person. Um, missed out on opportunity to do good, God gives them a second chance, second opportunity. That's called the second Passover, right? We learned this concept in the past. We're familiar with this idea from uh, past teachings. Okay, let's take a look. Text number three from the Rebbe. What is the difference between the first and the second Passover? The first Passover is default method of discharging the Paschal law offering obligation on the date assigned by the Torah. The second Passover is activated when one, discharge, when one discharges one's obligation in a disorderly manner on the incorrect date. Those who failed to bring the Paschal offering on the time on time did not lose their chance. The Torah made an exception and offered them a second opportunity. Right? So the first Passover represents the state of mind, the, the type of life that you always do things right. You're on time when you're supposed to be. You're doing what you need to do. You're doing the righteous thing. The second Passover represents a different state of mind. We slipped up. We missed out. Whether it was deliberate or an inadvertent, doesn't matter. You did something wrong. So as the Rebbe explains, you did something wrong. Oops. One second. The difference between the two Passovers is the difference between the righteous person and the penitent. The righteous person serves God in the way the Torah establishes. He is upright. 
a penitent is one who transgressed the Torah proper or the Torah's proper order. Now God provides the opportunity to correct the past and fill it with what was lacking. He's talking for a while and it's never too late. You can always make amends. You blew it. Blew it. And you blew it again. Blew it again. God always gives you another opportunity. After all, life is messy and we mess up. But we are not perpetually found out of favor. Heaven for fen. If you, uh, you know, the door was slammed on you because you walked out, you moved away from God. Well, there's another entry point that you can make. You can always come back home, right? And this is how the uh, Friedrich Rebbe encapsulates this in a beautiful manner. That the theme of the second Passover is that it is never too late. You can always make things right. Even one who is ritually impure or at a distance, and even in the case when it is deliberate, it can nevertheless be corrected. Hmm. Okay. So now with this, we can understand why the second Passover wasn't given at Mount Sinai originally. Because the second Passover is not like the first one. The first one is God giving the instruction and you doing it the way you're supposed to. Following the way, following the rules, following the God's plan. That's the first Passover. The second one is like, you know, you walked out. The door got slammed on you. Or you didn't make it on time, right? The door to the train closed. You missed the train. Does that mean you have no way to get back on? You missed the train. What happens? Sometimes you can climb on top. Right? You run quickly enough. Catch up to the train. When you realize the mistake that you made. And you want to correct whatever you need to correct. So now you could just run and maybe get on the back and run on top and, you know, get back on. Right? But what happens when someone does something wrong? You create a barrier between yourself and God. There's a distance. All right, the train is moving. There's a distance. Now you realize you did something wrong. There's a, there's a distance. There's a barrier. The doors are closed. That's what sin does. That's what when we do something wrong happens. But it doesn't mean that it is closed for good. Yeah, we can run after it. We can. And we can. Um, Get back on. Now we're not going to get back on through the regular door. <laughs> that door's closed. All right, but now maybe we can get on, you know, we can get uh, we have a regular coach. Now when you're running after it, uh, somehow you got into first class. <laughs> right. When a child is disobeying, they're not listening. You just hit them over the head and make them obey. Sometimes you just need to give them their space. And when they are come calm down and they get back to themselves, then you can help them. You can help them reconnect. So sin creates a space, a distance, a door closed, but it's only temporary. We always have the opportunity that we can climb back on and return. And that's the second Passover. 
with that we can understand that when the door is open to the train and you walk in that's the normal way of you know you're there on time yeah you bought your ticket and, and you're you're doing what you got to do so you're going through the regular doors and getting your seat and everything is perfect that's the first passover but the second one there was a a pause because you you missed getting on so now you have a choice you could like just okay that's it there's no lot it's a lost hope there's no chance or you could realize hmm i must take the initiative now and run after and get on I have to make an extra effort and the initiative have to come from me regular routine is like there's not much of an initiative you have to take in order to get onto the train you know you bought your ticket you're there on time and you're doing what you got to do you know you don't have to it doesn't take that much energy or or quality of you know of of your being but when you blew it now you can just sit there and oh i'm a victim of my circumstance or I blew it. I got to make good. So now you got to run after. You got to take the initiative. And that's why the Torah doesn't tell us up front about Pesach Sheni. Because the Torah and everything that it tells us is the regular way of living. Regular way of living. This is the law. This is what you got to do. Right? This is how you uphold your relationship and your connection to God. This, for the, this mitzvah, that mitzvah, whatever it is. So Moshe tells us the mitzvah and how we have to do it. How you have to get onto the train so you get to the destination you need to get to. How this mitzvah is going to bring the godliness into your life. I'm not telling you about how you're going to miss the opportunity. Ah, but now came it. You miss the opportunity. You're impure. You can't, you're distant. You can't bring the offering. So what happens? That, that means there's a pause. There's a separation. There's a distance. Well, a Mount Sinai, you know, are on top of the mountain. When, when Moshe is learning, he's learning everything. When there is no distance, no distance between him and God. There's no distance in, in the truth that he is teaching the people. Only when there is a distance that the that came from the Jew. Now the Jew has to come from within the desire to overcome that distance. Run after that train. Run after God. So the second Passover can only come when the initiative is from the people. They miss the doors are closed. They want to get onto the train. They need to get to their destination. They need to bring this godliness into this world. That this mitzvah is going to do. So now the request has to come from them. The desire has to come from them. So therefore, it wasn't toward the Mount Sinai until the request was made. And then God, of course, responds with great warmth, with a, a royal embrace. He says, no problem. Get back on. You ran after this? You want this? We're going to get you onto the train. Not only that, we're even going to give you first class. We'll get to the first class soon. The Rebbe's words. As a rule, the inspiration for repentance comes from within, not from God. Penitents are in a spiritual state of impurity. Penitents, that is. Their soul is impure, right? As we're speaking here in our uh, instance of the second Passover. In the present, their mindset is not one of purity. And they are certainly not in a holy mindset. They are uninspired by godliness. Nevertheless, they find their way 
the repentance. Repentance is, by definition, definition self-inspired. In other words, you buy your ticket, you bought your mitzvah, you bought your little Vanessa, you bought your twill, and you bought your, um, you, you, your wine for Shabbos. You brought, you know, you you got whatever you need for for doing mitzvahs, right? You bought your ticket. You're getting on the train. You're going to make it to the destination. You're going to bring the godliness. That's the routine. Even when it comes to those things, are you really free to choose? You are, but a lot of it is really not free to choose it's sort of routine I mean, every friday night i make yiddish every day i go to shul and i dive it right i put on my tulip that's routine in a sense well i mean if i were not to be very mindful in a sense i'm not really freely choosing to do this my habit that's doing it not so much me choosing to do it that's the regular routine of um of the doing it day in day out the right thing at the right time morning chance together you say maidani and you wash negelvasser you you relieve yourself you Get ready, Cl clothe yourself, you make the morning blessings. You go and, you know, I love my routine. We're out of routine, I uh, don't function as, as well as I'd like. And perhaps part of it is, and I'm sure part of it is, because routine, uh, you don't have to, you're not really freely choosing. You're just, you know, doing what you, I know, always do. So sometimes it could be, and you have to, and this is something we need to work on ourselves to be more mindful of. But that's not really free choosing. Where is real freedom of choice? Chuva, penitence, repentance. The doors are closed in front of you. In that moment, there's a void. There's a distance. There's a wall that has been created by our own lack, by our own sin. At that moment, I have a choice. To, oh, all right. I missed it. I blew it. That's it. All right. Call it a day. Or get deep breath. Mm. If I want this and I want this badly enough, I really want to connect. I really want to go on the journey. I want to go and bring this light of God into this world to change the world for good. I have to think at that moment because I just can't go with a regular routine and get, into, get on that train. I can only do that in that moment that I deliberately make a choice i'm running after that train i'm running after god ah there was a void there was something that was lacking a barrier that i created through my lack through my transgression now i'm freely choosing that i want to connect that's truly freedom of choice Ritual. And we see that, you know, when you have something good in your life and you never tasted sin, you never tasted that negativity. So to stay away from it, it's not much of accomplishment. Of course, you don't know what that is. You never tasted it. So you don't have the allure of it. You don't have the desire. You don't have the lust, as opposed to someone who was there. And they created now 
a distance. And that distance now makes the allure for that tempting, lustful thing even stronger. You have to give up a lot. And you have to work hard. Much harder. And therefore, the achievement is much greater. And therefore, the Talmud tells us, based on this, The Talmud tells us that the pedestal upon which the penitent stand, the one who repents, cannot be reached by those who are perfectly righteous. Because those who are repentant are reconnecting with God with much more fervor. You got to run for it. You got to run after that train to be on the journey. You have to really want it. And therefore, you're much more connected by that. You get into first class. You get at the pedestal that you're on is greater than the one who is perfectly righteous, who never touched anything that was negative, sinful, and therefore always connected. As the Zayar says, Rabbi Yossi said, we learn from the perfectly righteous people have no permission to enter a heavenly space occupied by those who repented on earth. This is because penitents, the penitents are closer to God and are drawn to God with more passion than everyone else. They are drawn ever closer to God with intense vigor. The Rebbe writes in a letter following to a someone who returned to Judaism later in life or having difficulty reconciling it with their past. To be sure that the period of time in the past when the daily life should have been different requires rectification, especially by means of a determined effort to improve the present and future so as to make up for the past. On the other hand, human nature is such that things that come easily are taken for granted and are not so appreciated and cherished as things for which one had to fight and struggle. Thus, the level of Yiddishkeit, which you and your husband have attained through real efforts, has permeated you more deeply and thoroughly. May gr God grant you that you, should both continue in the direction together with your children without allowing yourselves to be hindered or influenced in any way by the difficulties which you describe in your letter. On the contrary, the difficulties themselves can serve as a challenge and a stimulus to greater spiritual advancement, as is also explained in Hasidic literature. Okay, is that clear, folks? We're good? Hi, hi. Lechaim, Rabbi. Lechaim. to everyone. Okay. Okay, let's return to our conversation of the daughters of Tzlov Chad. That's how we began in our discussion. So, we just spoke about why God didn't tell Moshe about the second Passover until the people asked for it, right? Because it had to come from the people. They had to freely choose, make the choice. Do you want to be connected? Do you want to reconnect? It's going to take more effort. You have to dig deeper. You have to run faster to make it aboard. And to be on the journey, God's journey. 
And that's why it wasn't told at Sinai. The people had to ask in order that Moshe should ask God the question. But why didn't Moshe know the answer to the question about the daughters of Slavchad? It's, like it's a different issue. God had already taught the laws of inheritance. But Moshe forgot. Hmm. What does it mean he forgot? Moshe forgetting? That's not a normal thing. Moshe doesn't forget a thing. When you are connected with God, you don't forget a single thing. You see, Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya. Forgetfulness, forgetfulness stems from God being concealed in the body and in the soul that vitalizes it. Forgetfulness is an imperfection of the human condition. It's a defect, so to speak. God is perfect. God doesn't forget. Moses is God's man, learning directly from God. Everything made a, an impact upon him. He wasn't distant from God that he should forget. Likewise, in our own lives, when we are engaged right now, and studying with enthusiasm, really there. You know what? You're going to remember. And if you don't, maybe you're multitasking. Maybe you're not really engaged. Maybe you're not really here. But if you're fully engaged, you will remember. You won't forget. So when you feel close to God, very absorbed in godliness that's not a not possible to forget it'll be remained etched in our minds forever in that closeness to god and that's what Moshe was in a perpetual state of intimacy closeness to god so he's incapable of forgetting okay that's the case and why do you forget this law As Rashi explains, the law eluded him, and so he was punished for crowning himself with the authority by saying, and any case that is too difficult for you to bring me. But you can't forget. It's not possible. It's not possible. So why does he forget? Because God made him forget. Why? Because he took upon himself greatness. If you remember that in Exodus, when Moshe appointed a network of judges that would help him with the burden of judging the people. And he said, if you require any assistance, come to me. In other words, if a case that's too difficult for you, come to me with it. Now, of course they had to come to him. Who else but him knows as much as him? The word of God, of course. However, on his level of saintliness, of godliness, of holiness, to even say the truth as that is the truth, was a little tainted for him. And therefore, he is punished. What's his punishment? He forgets Allah. He forgets and therefore publicly when the question comes to him, he's forced to ask God. Right? So he's got to go back to his teacher, the God Almighty, to find out. So in a, in a certain sense, what does this require from Moshe? Shuba, repentance. He's got to go back to his teacher. Right. So this dovetails now the second Passover. Second Passover is legitimately about tshuva. You messed up the first time. Second time, you got an opportunity to make it good. Make it good. So likewise over here. Right. Moshe was taught this law. But 
because of taking upon himself, shall we say, too much, <laughs> right? Or not that he took upon himself, but the the suggestion of it in a very um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, slight manner, in a very very slight manner. You know that he says that well i'll take care of that you know so there's a common thread that emerges from these two stories right a concept of chuva a concept of having come to god to get the answer a concept of of those who are asking a question they need an answer right so in the second passover it's people who are impure they need an answer they want to come close that's penitence or someone who forgets as we just explained is also a lacking that needs penitence and therefore malaysia has to come to god closer to god to have the answer revealed right I mean, you probably all have experienced it. Um, if you ever forgot your wife's birthday, ooh, isn't that called a sin? Or what if you go to the doctor's office and the do and the secretary asks you, "Oh, when was your when was your daughter born?" Yeah. And you forgot. You feel embarrassed, right? What will happen in that embarrassment? What will happen if you forgot your wife's birthday? Thank God that never happened to me. <laughs> the chuva would be too great. <laughs> what would what happens? That mistake becomes seared in your mind, and you'll never forget. The embarrassment by the secretary that what, you know, when your daughter was born. Hmm. She yours. <laughs> um, you forgot your spouse's birthday. Hmm. You'll never forget again. That's, you know, real chuva. Right. Did you ever get work done in your house? Cheap labor? Or did you go to a, maybe a dentist was, you know, a cheaper second-rate dentist? And then the work you did in the house and the work you did on your mouth, you had to have it done over again because you went the cheap way? Certain lessons in life can't be learned. They have to be experienced. From the mistake that we make, we learn. We learn the hard way, but we actually do learn in a way that we wouldn't learn otherwise. That's the common thread over here. Is it has to come to learn is um, to experience it not being taught right now i'm teaching it's frontal learning is going on right now right hold on look how frontal it is i pinned me right that you're just being a recipient and that's one form of learning, but it's frontal and you're just a recipient. You're not initiating. You're not engaged. You're not, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say you're not engaged. You're not engaged in the sense that, that you're just taking in rather than giving. 
at the same time, right? Which is wonderful, which is what the Jewish people did with Moshe Rabbeinu, right? They just were there, he came up from the mountain, he had teachings to give, people came, and he taught, and they listened. And they made themselves into proper vessels to contain the teachings. But that's the up-down model, frontal teaching model, right? which is an important model, but it's not the only way to learn. That's one way giving over knowledge. But then there is experiential type of learning, right? The school of hard knocks, where you learn when you made a mistake through life, right? You do that, which is what we're talking about over here when we speak about Moshe Rabbeinu engaging the people. Here, he's engaging the people. It's coming from the people. They're the ones who made the initiative in Passover, second Passover, and in the land, the daughters of Slavchad. They initiated. They were engaged in the process of now bringing this new law to the people. It's a higher form of learning. They're part of it. They're part of the experience. It's not just the recipient of it. They help make the law, so to speak. How? Because it bothered them enough that they wanted to run and make it on, be part of the journey. Be part of the journey, Paschal Lamb offering, being part of the journey going into Israel and having a part of the land. You don't want to miss. That's a concept of tshuva. Actually, this is my own thought over here, and not in the Sikha, but maybe we can learn from here the two different levels of, of, of tshuva. And we're learning, we started today in, in Tanya, you recall, right? Chuba, there are two levels of Chuba. Because you're turning the hay in, go, in God's name, right? If you recall, let's just call for everybody. Chuba means Tashub hay, return the hay. What hay? God's name. God has two hays, though. The lower level is when you did something wrong. You got to fix it. That represents God's name, the hey, we'll learn, Tanya, that we're returning that. The hey in us, the hey in, in, in God, that we're returning our behavior, returning the lower level of chuba. That's the first Passover that you missed. You, you were impure or distant, right? But then there's a higher level. You didn't do anything wrong. You just want to get closer. That's the la the, the former hay. It's also Tashuv. It's called the higher level of, of Chuba, Chuba law, uh, where it's just about the desire for greater closeness with Hashem. Not prompted because of doing something wrong, but sensing the vast distance that you want to be on the journey in a more formidable, closer manner to God. And therefore, you're running after the train to make it out of love, not out of fixing something. Anyway, that's just a thought of mine that just came to mind in this idea. But the, the idea in both of it, it comes from the initiative of the individual as opposed to, you know, the righteous way, which is you're just following the path of God. Now, of course, that takes an effort you know, itself, but not the same kind of initiative as a person who wants, desires, freely chooses to connect in this deeper manner. Now with this, now we can understand the place where they met. So we just explain. I'm teaching frontal teaching. This is like, you know, Moses taught the people, right? But where did they come? They didn't come to the Ohel Moye, to the tent of meeting and find Moshe there or find him in a private place in his personal you know, studies. Found him in the house of study. What's a house of study? What's a base venture? What's a yeshiva? A yeshiva means 
is the place where you work out the ideas, where you're sitting with your chavrusa, you know, from one side of the uh, room and the other, the other side of the table, one side of the table, the other side of the table, and a room filled of people learning with their study partner. And sometimes when you hear the noise level in the yeshiva and you would see the debate and discussion, the discussion that's going on, you would actually think that these two guys must be enemies, that they are on different sides of the, uh, of the political map. And they probably part of cancel, cancel culture, that he's saying an argument in the, in the Talmud and he's giving his point of view and the other guy is canceling him with his argument. Well, they might be canceling each other's argument, but they're not canceling each other. There's a great bond in love. This is a place where everybody, whether you're a Moses or you're just a simple guy, right? Everybody has something to give in the discussion. Now, of course, when Moses is going to get up and now is going to give his teachings, that's a different story. But when you're sitting in a house of study and you're in the yeshiva, you're learning, there's no such thing as one's greater than the other. You have a question. You have a comment about what Moshe said, arguing with him. By all means. The Rebbe didn't like that when he spoke and we just accepted what he said. He wanted us to write into him and saying, We're tr I'm troubled by what you said by the Faring, and it doesn't make sense with this comment over here in Rashi, or it contradicts the Rambam over here. The Rebbe loved that. Well, we probably didn't do that as much as the Rebbe wanted us to do it. The challenge. He wanted the challenge. That's what house of study is. Now, when the Rebbe is in a Fabringen and he's espousing the word of God to us, you're not challenging then. That's Moshe Rabbeinu at the oil Mayad. He's speaking to the people. That's not the manner. That's top down. But there's a time for up down. The Rebbe is, he spoke the Fabringen. He said his Rashi, the, the Rashi teachings on the Parsha or whatever it is that he spoke about. If he went home and went to sleep and just accepted what the Rebbe said, no, that you had a challenge. You questioned something. You didn't question because you thought you were smarter than the Rebbe. That's not the point. The point of it is, as this house of study, there's a, a, a coming together of everybody, right? There's, it's bottom up. It's from everyone has an engagement. And that's why those questions were asked there. Because the whole point of this new teachings that came from the Torah was bottom up, from the initiative of those who were distant and wanted to bring up, have the opportunity to have the journey, have the connection of a Paschal Lamb offering. For those who the family was going to be lacking a connection to the land, the Holy Land of Israel, and therefore we're daughters, we want to have our part in the land. That was an initiative from down up. And therefore, where do you go to find that answer? In the house of study in the base Midrash. As the Rebbe says, this week's Sicha. The study hall is where we study Torah together. It is not a place where the Jews gather to hear a Torah lecture, a legal rendering, a sermon. From a sage. This means that though there is a rabbi or a dean in the study hall as well as students, everyone is encouraged to participate. Everyone is a partner in the dialogue. They hear the question, they debate. This tells us that the questions posed in the study hall are different from questions posed in a court or in a private study or of a rabbi or, or a judge. When you pose a question in a court or in a private study, the question is intended for the rabbi or the judge even if the courtroom or the study is filled with students. It's only meant for one person. When the, po the question is posed in a study hall, it is not directed exclusively to the dean or teacher, rather it's addressed to everyone present. Everyone considers the question, everyone is entitled to share an opinion. And hence the distinction of why it was in the house of study, because this is an initiative that comes from down, down below up, it started from the people, 
the request. So it's of the people. Is the request made in the place of study that everybody can have a part in it? Now, ultimately, you know, Moshe goes to God, but you know, this is to indicate the uniqueness of this particular teachings. As it ever says, the novelty of these two stories is that the response only came from above after a petition or a request was made from below. Both stories are associated with the study hall because both emphasize the importance of all Torah study. The atmosphere in the study hall emphasizes the importance of the student's study. This is unlike the, light, the large gathering place where the nation heard Moshe lecture or the national gathering of the year of Hakel, to hear God's words with the year of Hakel that we're in right now, spoken by the king. There, the emphasis was on the speaker. The role of the people was to listen and receive. The study hall is so different that every session at the study hall stimulates a new insight. The Talmud tells us when a colleague argue and debate, new Torah ideas rise to the surface. So this all dovetails nicely with the theme of repentance, of tshuva that we spoke about today. That the that we arrive at a greater connection when it comes from within, from with, uh, within us and our own process. That we are rather than something that's handed down from above. Right? That we need to experience it ourselves. We need to come from ourselves, and from this we come to a greater level of commitment, enhanced connection to Hashem as a result. And this is ultimately the concept of Mashiach. Mashiach is not a top-down engagement. Today is Yid Gimel, Tammuz, the Yont of the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe released from prison. One man stood up to an entire nation. <laughs> Why well, say an entire nation? It was, it was only uh, because the communists had Everybody working for them. When you were sitting at your table, you didn't know if your own child was an informer. You didn't even know that at times, that they were an informer to the KGB. That's how insidious was the communist regime. Very different than anything else. So it was one man stood up to everyone. And we are today that one man, each and every one of us. We are that one individual who can stand up against the tide. The tide of, whether it's cancel culture, whether it is the tide of just following what others do, that's real tshuva. Real tshuva is that you can stand up and do what God wants from us, needs from us, has planned for us. And that can only come from within. We freely choose that path. And then we have to run after the, the train. And we make it first class. Because we're all first class. We're all going first class as emissaries of God Almighty, of the Rebbe, to bring Mashiach and to change the world for good. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Okay. Thank you, people. Thank you. God bless. All right. ARC shortly. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.